I gotta say, this past weekend, we did one of the coolest things we've done on the channel so far. We had a chance to go up to Boston, Massachusetts to hang out with Bill Whitney and his buddy Bales at Calderwood Percussion. Um, at Steve Weiss Music, we, we've carried a couple of their field drums for the last couple years, and uh, they're really cool handcrafted instruments. Some of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Um, we're gonna take you through the shop and you can check out from start to finish what it looks like, some drums in progress, uh, some really interesting percussive items. If you're not hip to Calderwood percussion, hopefully this video will get you on the right track. So, without further ado, let's head up to Boston. We'll see you in a little bit. Oh, look! Hi there! Here we are. Yep. Welcome to Calderwood percussion. Uh, we're at Bill's shop today, uh, and look at all these drums. Yeah, we got uh, we got a lot. So we decided to stop by today because Bill is finishing up some rope drums for Weiss, and we like drums. So uh, could you give us a little bit of a tour of the shop? Yeah, love to. Cool. Let's do it. You want to start by checking out some of this stuff? Yeah. That's here? So um, this is uh, mostly stuff that we've made that is finished. Uh, some of it is. Uh, restorations that are in progress and, and kind of just a bit of a, a catch-all. Um, so as you can see, we do a lot of rope tension drums. Uh, this is kind of our, our main thing, both uh, these kind of rope tension field drums and also other historical percussion instruments. Uh, we will do some strict historical reproductions, but we also do some kind of anachronistic uh, period inspired drums where you get kind of the the character of a period instrument without some of the um, inconveniences, you know. Um, so sometimes that means, uh, let's see if we have anything here with the throw off. Yeah. Sometimes that means things like this. Uh, this is an orchestral field drum. Ooh. You can see it goes on on floor tom legs because, you know, drums this big, putting them on snare stands isn't really a thing. So it's got floor tom leg brackets. We've got just the, the pearl multi timbral strainer on there with a few different uh, gauges of natural gut. It has Super a cool. kangaroo skin batter head. So, you know, this is sort of like, you know, in, in my opinion, kind of the ultimate orchestral field drum. It is absolutely that period field drum vibe with a natural batter head. It's got the rope, um, but you know, with the kind of modern conveniences of, of the floor toms and, and the the multi timbral snare throw and um, so you know we kind of run the gamut between actual period and um, period vibe with modern playability. So like I mean how long have you been doing this? Like how did give, give us a little bit of the story how did how did <laughs> like uh, it's funny pe people are going to see the rest of the shop in a moment here we're kind of we're tucked in like one corner mm -hmm. of uh, Bill's kind of playground here right but like, how did this all start? I, I know a little bit of the story, but most people probably won't. So, so uh, you're not even a percussionist <laughs> by trade. So yeah, yeah, that's true. So uh, I went to school for tuba, actually. Uh, tuba and electric bass are my main instruments that I, you know, as far as any professional performing goes. Uh, but all my roommates in college were percussion majors. And so there were a lot of nights with, you know, chopping out on a coffee table. Um, and then when I got out of college, the, a bunch of the first jobs that I was able to get were, were either teaching drum lines or uh, writing drum line books. Um, you know, not super advanced school programs, but still, I mean, that's a lot of the work I was doing. And then from there I was teaching middle school and then high school band. Um, but all the while, you know, I mean, I, I kind of had this background in percussion, both because uh, James Madison has an awesome music ed program. So I was well prepared for that, but also just you know, all my roommates and friends being percussion majors and total like DCI nerds, you know? So, so if you were in James Madison's in Virginia, yes. Mm -hmm. So if you were in Virginia, what brought you up to Massachusetts? I, I'm from New Hampshire Oh, cool. and I just wanted to come back to Boston. And so, yeah, when I got here, I was teaching and, and, um, I love to teach, but working in schools, I don't love. And, uh, when an opportunity for a job doing sound design for a video game company kind of fell in my lap, I had to take it. So I, 
I moved to uh, Harmonix, which is the company that did the first two Guitar Heroes, all the Rock Band games, Dance Central, some other things. So I worked on everything from Rock Band 2 through, well, Fantasia, which I'm sure you've never heard of because Disney paid us to make it, but nobody bought it. Oh, wow. Uh, so, I, you know, doing sound design there. And I've always been into audio engineering and, and um, you know, recording, mixing, stuff like that. So the tech side wasn't a big leap for me to do that. And while we were there, we, uh, we did a lot of kind of building our own noisemakers uh, for, for to, to sample, both for sound design and, and for, for, you know, music. Like, there was this prototype of a game we were doing. It had this very steampunky vibe. And so uh, we made this, the, the musical score for it, we, we kind of made all our own instruments. Uh, me and a, a buddy of mine there took an old guitar he had and, and cut the neck off and set it at an angle with a cello bridge so you could play it with a bow. And then we made a band, a contrabass banjo with a 22 inch kick drum shell and big piece of stair rail to play it like a string bass and all kinds of weird stuff. And so, you, so you essentially got paid to to like make cool yeah. stuff, sample it. I mean, is that like yeah, the that's like good. the dream kind it was of? Seriously, you know I mean? one of the coolest jobs there is. Uh, it was it was super fun. Um, and uh, in the course of doing that, I got into making drums. You know, mostly just for myself, but then. Uh, when bands would come to, to my studio and, and record, I'd every once in a while be like, here, why don't you try this? You know, a snare drum for the, for the drummer. And people liked them and asked me to make more. And after, you know, when I, when I, I lost my job at Harmonix, I was like, well, if I'm ever gonna make this into a thing, now's the time. And that was almost 10 years ago. And you've had drums kind of all over the place. I'm, I'm going to cut some of these drums over here, but, but I mean, your drums have been played by all sorts of pros in Fife and Drum, but also on Hamilton the Musical. Yeah, I mean, Hamilton, uh, all, all the projections of Hamilton have a couple of our drums. Um, we did a full drum line for the West Point Hellcats. Uh, the SpongeBob SquarePants Broadway show, we did the drums for that. Cool. Um, Trying to think some of the other kind of high profile stuff here in Boston, you know, Handel and Hyden Society, we've done a bunch of work for them um, and kind of period instrument on song. We send stuff everywhere, like the Hong Kong Philharmonic used some of our rope drums for a recording of the ring cycle. Um, so just sent just sent a, a couple of Nakers to a guy in Israel, um, which, you know, Nakers being predecessors to the modern timpani, a little yeah. bit hard to find. Uh, this one is has a steel bowl. Uh, we do them out of steel and copper. Um, this is a can ooh, a lot of snares ringing. But uh, kangaroo <laughs> now, skin you, head on this did one. Did you start making these out of your own want to make them, or was there there was probably a need? I would imagine because I, I I can't really think of other people manufacturing this kind of stuff. Uh, well, yeah, kind of. It was one of the times I was doing work for Handel and Hyde, and they wanted a Tabor, uh, very similar to this Tabor. Um, and uh, the the percussionist uh, John Hess actually he he sent me some some stuff from Lafima who mm -hmm. makes one of these but Lafima stuff is pretty hard to get in the states and he's like I want a Tabor just like this can you make me one so I did cool. and uh, this I'm, this is the second one I made he's got the the prototype and as I was looking through Lafima stuff I saw these nakers and I was like wow that looks like a salad bowl with a head on it. And um, so I just wanted to see if I could do yeah. it. And so, so I did and I made some of those and then a few people got excited about like, oh, could you tune that to like a high D and F sharp for um, the, the Mio, um, what was it, Creation of the Creation World? Creation of the World, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, uh, that's a good idea. So now I've been working on a rod tension version. Oh, uh, cause, so this, this is prototype Calderwood right now. Yeah, yeah. The, the rope tune nakers, you can tune them to a specific pitch, but to really get the head clear is pretty challenging. Yeah. Um, so now I'm working on on uh, you know the, a rod tune version that would be easier to to actually tune to those pitches and maybe get two of them on on a, a mount like still on a cymbal stand, you know, one for cool. D and F sharp or whatever. I mean, there's other pieces, especially I think French literature that calls for like screaming high timpani, right? But yeah. Um, so you know, just. That's pretty some cool. Some of it's though. born out of a need and some of it's born out of, I'm just a huge instrument nerd. Like I just <laughs> love instruments and I see something new and I'm like, ah, I, I kind of want to make that. Yeah. So I guess the next thing I would ask is that 
is it just you? Who is Calderwood Percussion just <laughs> you? Is it are you the man behind the brand, or uh, is there are there other folks it's, here? It's mostly me. It's not I, definitely not fair to say that it's just me. I mean, I've had a tremendous amount of help from my family, who are sure. wonderfully supportive. Uh, over the years, a number of people have kind of come through the shop. Uh, my my buddy Brian Bales is here a lot. We may even see him later on over the course of filming this. Um, and I've had I've had a number of people in through here to help me. Uh, uh, Greg Savino interned here for a while and, and was a tremendous help, especially when we were building that giant uh, eight foot bass drum for um, for Ottawa University. Uh, and um, my buddy Caleb Wheeler has been in and out for especially in the beginning. He was a huge help. So it's it hasn't it's not just me. I mean, I'm the one who's always here i'm kind of the driving force behind the thing but to say that this is just me is, is really disingenuous i've had a lot of help but generally you are a handcrafted small business yeah you i are. mean i'm nothing leaves this shop that i didn't work on yes um cool you know so i'm i'm i would say everything here is you know 80 percent built by me cool can we check out some of the shop you want to yeah, you want to show us around a little bit sure we'll follow you cool Here we've got uh, some stuff in progress. There's um, one of these Yamaha snares where the, the bottom bearing edge collapsed. Oh. Uh, this belongs to, I think, Tallwood High School in Virginia. So we got to fix that. So which... you're doing repair work in addition to the stuff that you're doing in terms of just- Yeah, yeah, we do a lot of repairs and restorations. Typically the, typically the restorations are things that are like, uh, in this shop, when we say something is vintage because it was made in the 60s, we mean the 1860s. <laughs> like we don't like, you know, a, a 70s Slingerland is not yeah, yeah. vintage around here. And, you know, we'll, we'll repair anything. But if we're going to do like a full restoration, then it's typically something that's like either very old or very special. But things like this, you know, the, the bearing edge is crushed. So we'll cut off the damaged area and graft on a new section with a, with a re-ring. And so cool. it won't happen again. You know, stuff like that. We do a lot of these kinds of repairs. Um, here's a, uh, a rosewood snare oh, that wow. is I gotta go close ready up on to, this guy. Look at you that. can see it's been wet sanded and so now it's, we're going to buff out the finish so it'll have a, a mirror shine. Now this is that is, a, uh, for Josh a, Orlando. Is that a shell that just is manufactured by a company already or did you create that shell? Uh, we don't do, we don't do in, well, we do very little laminating okay. shells here. So this was done by CVL in okay. Italy. Cool. Um, and typically with, with our laminated stuff, you can see up here, we've got a bunch of shell stock, some of it's Keller, some of it's Nordic. Oh. Um, and we, you Nordic's know, just buy Minnesota, tubes. Minnesota, I think, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, cool. um, but then there's a lot of, of, you know, from the tube to a drum, there's a lot of work. So whether it's like, you know, we, we need to change how many plies it is or add re-rings or whatever, there, there's a lot of woodwork that happens from there. But the, the actual tubes, we don't press them here. Now, are these like over on this side? Are these hoops? Or are uh, these just, it, just thinner shells? Some some hoops, some shell cutoffs, um, just uh, a wide variety of of things, and uh, some of our rope back there, and, cool. and hoops and and shell cutoffs. Nice. Um, so then, this is the actual workshop. You can see there's a couple of nakers here oh. in progress, sitting on top of our Mahler box. Man, look at that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's cool to be here, not only to just see the shop, but to see like you just showed us the product and then there's the product, you know, in yeah. production. You know what I mean? Yeah, so totally. You got, I mean, you got a lot of equipment in here. Yeah, so. Um, Including some speakers too, I'm assuming, uh, blast some tunes sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, nice. You know, it's, it's mostly a wood shop, but as we do more and more of the historical reproductions, you know, with the rope drums, if we're actually really trying to copy a, a specific historical instrument, like you can't get that hardware. So we have to make all the hardware for that. So mm. hence the, you know, the lathe and the milling machine and the surface wow, grinder. So you're, so you're like straight up fabricating. Yeah, a, a lot of hardware. A lot of the hardware. I mean, when it's something modern where, you know, you can get off the shelf parts, that's obviously the way to go. But um, for the historical stuff, we pretty much just have to make it. Yeah. Um, there's also a local foundry that we, that we use a lot for 
some of the parts, it makes more sense to cast them rather than machine them, or sometimes yep. we'll have them do a casting which then gets machined or, you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, for the, for the period stuff, you pretty much, with the exception of the shells, because I don't typically do steam bent, uh, it's pretty much all laminated, even on the period stuff, because mm. it's just for the, the benefit that you get for additional, everyone has a different opinion about this. Yep. I don't want to be controversial here, but <laughs> I think the, the, the stability that you get out of a laminated shell is, is, you know, very much worth that historical concession, but I'm sure we'll, we'll have somebody chirp in the comments. Yeah, about that. I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> sure we will. Uh, so some other stuff in progress. Um, right look now at, we're- Look at this thing. I, I, it sounds funny, but the, the camera doesn't really do, I, I gotta do like a, the camera doesn't really do justice to just how, look at that thing. Yeah, it is uh, 25 kind of, inches deep and 36 inches in diameter. Wow. It's a big drum. That is a big drum. Um, definitely not the biggest we've made, but it's a big drum. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a huge proponent of rope tension concert bass drums. Um, you don't see them very often. I mean, obviously, you know, a few major orchestras have them. You'll see like LA, you'll see from time to time and, and a few others, but uh, a really cool thing about rope tension drums that I never would have learned had I not gotten into this, building these rope tension instruments for, you know, historically informed performance or whatever. And then I kind of realized that there's a lot of benefits to this tuning method that maybe we could apply to, to modern, you know, performance situations. So the cool thing about a rope drum is the shell is totally free floating, right? So that type of resonance that you get out of a free floater, uh, you know, you get that out of a rope drum. Um, in addition, there's no metal on, well, there's almost no metal on this thing, right? Which means less mass and dramatically less rigidity. In, now, how, something's not gonna rattle if there's nothing to rattle on it. That's also one right. of the really big benefits is there's no metal parts, nothing rattles. Uh, but the cool thing about the, the less mass, less rigidity thing, um, especially the you know, decrease in rigidity, it brings the resonant frequency of the entire system down, which means your available tuning range shifts down. So this will resonate at a much lower frequency than, uh, than a comparable rod tension will just because it doesn't have that hardware. Um, so, you know, you can get this, you can get this to just very, very quiet and, and fully resonant at extremely low pitches. So really, really fantastic drum in an orchestral setting. The thing that I think scares most people away from rope tension drums is the difficulty in tuning and changing heads. And I would have thought that too before I got into this stuff, but mm -hmm. honestly, it's really not a problem. I mean, changing heads takes a little bit longer, but it's not, it's not difficult. And, uh, and as far as tuning goes, it's, it's as simple as this, you know? Hmm. It's just moving these ears back and forth, right? And so this has 12 ears on it, which, you know, more or less corresponds to 12 uh, tension rods. But if you prefer, you can make it have six, where mm. if we just drop every other one, disengage every other ear, yeah. then you effectively have a six lug drum. And you could, and so I guess this tunes the same on both sides, right? Yeah, so it is, it is single tension. You can't, um, you can't tune the, the heads independently. Um, that's good and bad. The, the good thing is because of, of the way the rope is, it, it, it kind of evens itself out. Um, it is very, very easy and fast to tune this in a way that it resonates with a beautiful, clear sound. Um, if you're going for a specific pitch, if you're like, I need my bass drum to be an A, mm -hmm. well, that gets a little bit more difficult. Little, but yeah. if you just want a beautiful sound that is resonant in a wide range of sort of pitch ranges, super, super easy to do. Um, if you prefer to have, you know, a different pitch on, on either side, mm -hmm. the way to do that is with the thickness of yeah, the heads. I was going to say, you use, so, use a thicker head on your batter side if you want the other side to be a little higher, you yeah. get a thinner head. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so, you know, you do still have some control over that, uh, but it's not by manipulating the tuning, it's huh. by, you know, by your head selection. Yeah, very cool. Well, what do you have on this, head, on this right now? On the uh, right now, uh, Evan Stratus. Cool. Um, I, I kind of run hot and cold on, on those depending on, I don't know, my favorite bass drum heads change a lot. I 
For a lot of things, I think the Stratus sound great. For other things, I think the, the new skins by Remo are, are a better choice. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, it kind of depends on the application. Cool. So I'm working on another one of these right now. This is for um, the Stanley Clark Academy in South Bend, Indiana. I always laugh when I hear that name because of course Stanley Clark, yeah, the baseball bass player. player. Yeah. Um, Shout but, out to Stanley Clark. <laughs> I know, right? But uh, the school is unrelated to- Oh, really? The, uh, yeah, <laughs> which is, I don't know, that's really funny to me. So uh, they just ordered one of these. This is um, 22 by 32. Uh, it's uh, uh, maple and poplar, the shell, and then just a, a cherry veneer on it. Cool. Uh, and over on the table saw here are the, the hoops for it. Oh, wow. Those and cool. I, this hoop design is something that I, I mostly came up with. Uh, it's sort of a, influenced by a number of things. Yamaha. Yeah, because you've got the, the actual, where the rope goes through. Yeah. Through so the it's, actual. So it's recessed, you can see here. So you have this low profile hoop design inspired it, you know both by yamaha drum set hoops and if you're familiar with the rope drum world there's a there's a rope drum maker named george kubachek who builds wonderful quirky instruments and and he had a hoop design kind of similar to this that i saw and you know just kind of a combination of influences this is the low profile hoop design i came up with yeah when um, i was when i was looking at it originally i was like oh wow he's got like a cover for the you know it almost looks like yeah. it like it just kind of covers up where your, your tuning points are gonna be, but it's really just hidden in there. It gets it nice, to, nice and close to the bearing edge, I would imagine, too. Yeah, yeah, so it's just, you know, whatever technique you're using, there's enough hoop to protect the edges, but, you know, you're, you're never gonna accidentally catch a stick on the rim. Uh, and if you do, the rim is plenty beefy enough to handle it. Um, and also for, for stuff that, that calls for playing, you know, playing on the rim, or uh, like if you're using a root or something, uh, you know, you have this big chunky wood block of a hoop. Cool. So. Nice. And yeah, it's a uh, beautiful drum, man. And you can see here, I've just been working on this, the suspension frame for, for this new one. Again, I'm all about having as little metal as possible because <laughs> there's nothing to rattle. Yeah. Right? So, uh, this is, uh, it's laminated one inch Baltic birch plywood. So cut, you know, two layers of this one inch plywood glue them together and you wind up with something that is extremely dimensionally stable. Uh, really, really strong. And there, again, there's almost nothing on this that could rattle. So uh, you can, you know, with, again, rope tension drums, especially with this kind of stand, you can tune it insanely low, mm. have the instrument still resonate and never worry about anything rattling. So Very rope cool. tension bass drums in orchestra, that's where it's at. <laughs> so, and now you're finishing up some rope uh, snare drums for us at Weiss, right? Yep. So is that what that puppy is behind there? Uh, yeah, this is cool. right here. Um, this is one that's gonna go to you guys. We just finished the hoops for it the other day. Um, two sets, they're uh, maple hoops with uh, just mahogany veneers. Cool. Um, now I know too, maybe you can talk a little bit about the design, but we kind of purposely, you know, at Weiss, we want to, we want to have products that are, I don't want to use the term generalized, because obviously this is, as you can see, this is like a custom product. Yeah, but versatility is important. Right. And, and, you know, we don't always go for a super flashy finish with mm -hmm. what we order, you know, from you, because we want it to be, someone wants a rope drum, they need a rope drum, and we want to give it to them at a competitive price. We want to buy something that's handmade that's not going to yeah. fall apart. You know what I mean? So this is probably not your most customized model, I guess is what I'm getting at, right? But yeah. sound wise, it's probably comparative. It's, it, yeah, it's it's very representative of all the rope drums that we do. It's uh, the design is much simpler, but in terms of the way it plays, the way it feels, the way it sounds, like all of that is on par with anything else. So. Uh, it's a, a six ply maple shell with three rings, which is kind of the standard that we do across the board. It's the, it is, I don't know, to me, the sound that I get out of this versus an actual, you know, period accurate steam bent shell. I don't know. I don't think I could tell the difference blindfolded. I mean, I suppose uh, if you're uh, if you're on a field for a must or two, <laughs> I don't know if you're going to tell too 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 much of a difference. I don't know. I will, I'll probably get some flack in the comments. I, I'm 100% <laughs> sure that people in the comments will think that they can hear the difference. Absolutely. Cool though. 
Um, the, but, in particular, but that's why the hoops look like really cool. I'm kind of like my jaw is dropping a little bit. On yeah. The uh, so these are these begin as 12 ply hoop stock, then we laminate some more plies, and then and then add the veneers. So these are laminated maple again, very very strong and dimensionally stable. And you know, and it's the same with the shell, right? So the going with the thin six ply shell gets us the the sound and feel we want and the dimensional stability we want of a laminated maple shell. Um, one thing that we do with the Steve Weiss drums that we don't do all that often is using a modern throw off. Uh, it's, it's, you know, just a, a brass side throw. Um, so it's brass, it, it still kind of has the vibe of something older, which is nice, but you have the um, sort of that modern playability of like, you need to be able to turn off the snares if yep. for no other reason than, um, you know, sympathetic snare buzz. That said, we do use natural gut on these, just like everything else, and, and that is less susceptible to sympathetic snare buzz, but still. So we put a throw off on these, um, but you know, it's the same, and, and we do use synthetic heads for the Steve Weiss drums, because you know, using natural heads is a bit of a choice, mm -hmm. and like, uh, I love the sound and the feel of natural heads, whether it's calf or goat or kangaroo, um, but like we say, for the versatility that Steve Weiss is looking for, probably not the answer. Right, I, so, I imagine most people that are gonna want a natural head on their drum are gonna have a specific natural head that they're gonna wanna put on it too. Yeah, exactly. In terms so, of either gauge or, you know, yeah. Yeah, what what species, things right. like that. But but um, while, you know, the, the synthetic head seems like a good choice for that reason, still going with natural gut, yeah, it does move with humidity, but nowhere near as much as a natural head does. And it's really not like it really doesn't cause a problem. I mean, right. you don't have to adjust the snare. I mean, you'd adjust the snares to play anyway, right? So um, so we do use natural gut on the Steve Weiss drum. So that is really where a lot of that characteristic field drum sound comes from. Um, and uh, yeah, other than that, no bells and whistles, no additional hardware, except for these, uh, these carry loops that we do. This is uh, cast brass that we have, you know, like I said, locally cast and then we, cool machine them to accept uh, a stainless steel uh, insert in there. So whatever kind of carry hook you have isn't gonna wear away at the brass. Uh, so it's really strong, really stable. So this drum is entirely from materials to finish made in the United States? The only thing that isn't is the vent grommet. All right. Uh, other than, oh, and, and the throw off. The throw off on, the, on these in the vent, with most of our drums, Everything is made in the U.S. Most of it's made here. The vent grommet is the only thing. Sometimes we make our own vent grommets mm -hmm. uh, if it's for something period or if we want to use wooden vent grommets. Um, but, uh, but generally speaking, the vent grommet is the only thing that is not made in the States. On the Steve Weiss drums, it's just the vent grommet and the, uh, the throw off. Still pretty cool though. I mean, and it's funny, I'm, I want to get a little closer here too, because like this, what kind of finish? This is just like a glossy, how many coats is this? Um, it's, it, Varies from four to six coats, depending on how much wet sanding happens or scuff sanding happens in between coats. Uh, this is a marine varnish. All the products we use for drums that'll be used outdoors are all um, marine price oh, wow. stuff for boats, right? Because cool. if if you know it's good enough for a yacht, it'll probably right, handle a marching right, drum, right? Right. So uh, this is a Total Boat Halcyon. It's a water-based marine varnish. It's incredibly strong. Uh, it's totally UV stable. So. Um, you know, your March to Parade starts to rain, whatever, man, you right. know, uh, it's, it's not going to be Especially a problem. Especially you got a synthetic head on it, you're pretty much good to go. Yeah. Now and start to finish, like how long does it take you to make one of these drums? Uh, it's, it's about 25 hours of, oh, wow. of work, but because you got to wait for glue to dry and, and varnish to cure yeah. out and stuff like that, that happens over the course of, you know, six weeks maybe um because because even once the final coat of varnish goes on in order to really get to get this kind of mirror shine uh the finish has to be very very hard before you begin wet sanding and buffing so you got to give it a couple weeks to really really fully harden cool. um before before you can do that so uh yeah it's it's for this a drum like this it's it's i don't know 20 to 30 hours of labor but that happens over the course over of about period six of time, weeks right I feel like sometimes when people, you know, particularly when they're ordering a drum, you don't sometimes think that almost every drum is custom in, in, a, in a way because yeah. it has a process that it goes through that it has to be 
you know, dried and then it has to be finished. So it's not like you can in one, I mean, you could in theory, but it's not like in one day you could crank out one drum. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, with, there are, there are occasional exceptions, uh, you know, where if you're gonna put a wrap on a drum or like those, those brocade wrap piccolo snares we saw, uh, things like that, or, or acrylic, I have on occasion had somebody call me in an emergency. Um, you know, somebody dropped an acrylic snare and they're about to go on tour. Mm. And I, I had, I did once turn around an acrylic snare for somebody same day. Oh wow. But I, I had all the materials here right. already. So it was like, and it well. it would have to be in, uh, in the condition to be able to be assembled that day, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So I, I had a full tube of acrylic that I could cut and I had, and I was like, as long as you're cool with these lugs and this throw off, cause it's what I have, yeah. I can make you this today. But, but that, that's very, very rare. Most yeah. of the time it, it's more like this where it happens over the course of a couple months or, you know. Right, and we, we feel fortunate at Weiss that we were kind of able to design with you how we wanted it to look like. And, um, you know, I imagine that your customers are able to do that when they, you know, when they order directly as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, we'll, we'll make anything. Yeah. Like, literally anything there's a, a turkish crescent over there where we can we can look at oh we, we should will, check that out i remember we that. will make anything we made a 90 inch bass drum for a university in um in kansas so these are turkish crescents uh one of the things that we really love to do here is stuff that nobody else will make i mean that's kind of our our niche right uh well you I, got somebody had to have wanted it if you made it i guess yeah right? yeah, <laughs> yeah it, so. it, exactly and it's so weird custom stuff that's extremely hard to find, especially if it's historical, like I love that. Yeah. I love old weird instruments. So having this be the, the place where we've had the most success really works out. So these uh, Turkish Crescent, if you're unfamiliar, it's also called a Jingling Johnny, is an instrument that comes from the military band tradition of Turkey or at the time, the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. Empire, right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so the, the Janissary bands or their military bands uh, would have would have these uh, as well as you know a variety of other kinds of percussion instruments and um, it's it's sort of a it's both like a like a standard like a flag and and a, a instrument mm -hmm. and so uh, as that genocide percussion was becoming uh, very influential on the uh, the sort of Viennese composers of the time you know Handel and and uh, uh, Mozart and like you know that kind of sort of uh, earlier European classical music, uh, these instruments came into the orchestra. Now, they're not used very often, but, but they are still occasionally used. Uh, so the reason we did this was the Handel and Haydn Society here in Boston, which is, I think, the oldest continuously running orchestra in the country. Um, they're a period instrument ensemble, uh, obviously called the Handel and Haydn Society, so you know what period they <laughs> <laughs> they kind of they live around. So they were doing a uh, Haydn's Hundredth Symphony, the military symphony, and um, that doesn't specifically call for Turkish crescent, but it is have kind of a Janissary percussion section. So they wanted to use one of these, and so they called me to see if if I would make one, and I obviously jumped at the opportunity. And when I was thinking about how to design it, I did a lot of looking online. Um, you might be familiar with uh, a Spanish percussionist named David Valdez, who has a wonderful mm. uh, blog uh, called Percuse Me, I think. It's He's got some really great books and stuff too that we actually listed oh. really recently. Too. Yeah, he just did the, the Soldier's Tale yep. edit that, that you guys saw. Yeah, really uh, wonderful work. His stuff is very well researched. And he'll do these deep dives on, on instruments and then he'll build himself one. So I was looking at his the way he built his Turkish Crescent and a few other things online. And um, then I, I remembered that here in, in, at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, they have a, a lovely musical instrument collection and they have a Turkish crescent that is, you know, a 250 years old probably. And that instrument is on like all of their kind of posters and promotional material because it's such an unusual looking thing. And uh, to me, that has always been kind of emblematic of that collection at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So kind of on a whim, I just called the museum and asked if I could talk to the curator of the musical instrument collection. And I got the guy on the phone and I told him who I was and what I was doing. And I asked if I could come study their Turkish Crescent. 
cool. And to my amazement, the dude said yes. <laughs> so I went to the museum and they brought me into like kind of the back room where all this stuff is stored and gave me some gloves and just handed me this 250 year old Turkish Crescent. Wow. And I was like, oh my God. Uh, so I, I, I measured it and I, I played it and I, I tried to get as good a sense of, of how everything was manufactured as I could. And then the curator showed me a bunch of other really cool stuff in the museum and, and played some of the uh, instrument. It was, it was a really, really cool experience. Um, if you're ever doing research, call a museum. That's why they're well, there. They'll I gotta help you. say, it's like, you know, it's funny. You, you talk about all this stuff you make and it's just so cool to me that you seem like a guy that does his homework and a person that, that researches and you want it to be accurate. You don't really cut corners, you know what I mean? And it's just, yeah. that, that to me is one of the coolest things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I really strive for um, reasonable period accuracy. Um, you know, I, I will definitely make concessions so that the instrument is playable. Um, but, but yeah, I wanna know what it's supposed to be and then I wanna decide how much of that am I going to do versus what am I going to change? But you got to know what it is first, right? And, and also what's going to make it most musically, I guess, adaptable to modern times, right? You know? Yeah. So, so what, uh, can we hear this thing a little bit? Yeah. I, it's, so, it's funny. So all that said, this is not exactly a copy of the one in the Boston Museum yep. of Fine Arts, but it is very, very heavily inspired by. Cool. So, wow. I'm just gonna add, can you just keep shaking this so I can get a little bit of a cool. I mean, it's just the, the thing is as tall as you. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I should have done like a, uh, like had you like video you assemble it because it <laughs> takes a little while. You yeah, know well, I mean? so this one, this is made out of a, two trombone bells, a trumpet bell. This was a sousaphone bell that I cut up Oh, wow. Uh, these were horns that were beyond repair. Um, and so this, uh, oh, actually the, the centers are uh, made out of trombone slide rails, but there's there's steel rod in the middle to strengthen so it. So your, your tuba experience, your brass experience <laughs> came in handy here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we made this one first, and then I've had a lot of people ask about purchasing or renting one of these. And this instrument, part of, I think, what gives it its charm is, is it's kind of ricketyness, but that's not good for a rental instrument. Mm. So we needed to come up with a sort of a production version of this, and that's what this is. So this um, is built pretty much the same way where we have two trombone bells and a trumpet bell. Rather than doing the, the heavy three-dimensional crescent, this is aluminum plate that I powder coated. Um, and unlike the original version, this can be fully disassembled. So all these pieces come off, the, the center shaft is in two pieces, you just unscrew it like a pool cue. And so it can actually go in a case, we can wow. ship it anywhere. If you purchase one, you can store it. So this, which uh, is a little more clanky and clattery than, than the first one, which honestly makes it more like the original. Yeah. Um, this was sort of inspired. We did one of these for Interlochen and, and Keith Leo kind of, you know, gave me a lot of advice on, on how he thought it would sound the best. And one of his things was to use as many cast bells as possible. Mm. So that's, that was really factored into the design of this new version. Cool. So we've now made, I think, three of these. Uh, one's at Interlochen, um, one's in another percussion rental collection. Um, and this, which we have here for rent or, you know, we sell them to. Super cool. So, yeah, they're uh, beautiful. Yeah. They're shiny. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh -uh. The powder coating is really cool on the crescent. Yeah, and, and when this brass kind of patinas a bit more, it will sort of match this, this powder coated color yeah. a little bit better and then it'll just all look like brass. Super cool. And now I gotta, I gotta ask, because since it's handmade, mm -hmm. start to finish, what are we talking on one of these bad boys? Like, what does it cost or how long did it take? How long does it take? Uh, I mean, this thing, I- So everything on this is machined here. Yep. With the exception of these, uh, the first, originally I was making these here, but um, I just had a sheet metal supplier water jet them for me. It saved yep. a ton of time, but everything else is machined here. So uh, I, I, it was like a solid three weeks all day, every day. Wow. 
Maybe labor a little of love. more. Yeah, it's it's labor of love. This is a, a very involved instrument to build. Very cool though. Wow. Nice. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Sure thing, man. Nice. Uh first, thank you very much for, for coming by and checking out uh what we do here. Um you know, being in Boston and uh being so into sort of historical percussion, I I am nerdy about this, but I think it's really cool that there's this long history of really excellent drum making in New England and specifically in Boston. You know George Stone, uh, I'm sure that you've worked through Stick Control by George Lawrence Stone, but his father was a great drum maker um, here in Boston and there were many others and just kind of that connection between uh, this city and making these beautiful instruments is something I think is really cool. Um, and uh, also thanks Steve Weiss because, you know, being a little custom shop, I mean, it's really just us here. Um, it's kind of hard for us to get out into the world and, and for the folks at Steve Weiss to kind of take a chance on us that, you know, these are going to be good instruments that, that do well for you guys. Something we really appreciate. It, it benefits us a lot. And, uh, and yeah, we, we are a custom shop, you know, which makes it a little harder for us at, at most retail markets because, you know, everything we do is custom and made to order. But uh, the partnership with Steve Weiss has actually worked out great. There have been a couple of schools where someone bought a rope drum that we made from Steve Weiss and then, uh, you know, really loved it and decided they wanted to start a rudimental drumming program at their school and then oh, called cool. us to make a whole drum line that matched the drum they bought from Steve Weiss. And so in that way, I think this partnership has worked out really, really well. And, awesome. um, and yeah, we're, we're excited to see what else, you know, the concert times have been cool and, and maybe there's a few other things in the pipeline. So, um, yeah, we're really excited about that. And, uh, yeah, you see what we do here. It's uh, it's all custom. We'll make anything. We love weird stuff. So, uh, <laughs> You need something weird you can't find anywhere else, now you know who to call. So good. thank you. Yeah, I can't imagine uh, these rope drums will be the last thing we get for you. So <laughs> that's cool. the plan. All right, thanks again, you guys. Absolutely, thank you.